this is my 20th year in the industry. Um, you know, it would be, sadly, it would be a bit strange if I didn't have a, a little bit of burnout at this point, right? <laughs> Welcome back to the Free Code Camp Podcast. I'm Quincy Larson, teacher and founder of FreeCodeCamp.org. Each week, we're bringing you insight from developers, founders, and ambitious people getting into tech. This week, we're joined by Suze Hinton. She's a software engineer, security researcher, and she was one of the pioneers of live coding on Twitch. Suze, how's everything going with you? It's going great, thanks. Um, I'm really excited to be on this podcast, given that we've known each other for a while. So, Yeah, and this is like the first time we've actually had like a synchronous conversation. I think we may have been on some podcasts together, like guests mm -hmm. on like JS Party or some of these other podcasts, mm -hmm. but I don't think that I've ever actually talked to you in real time back and forth like this. No, it's always been like email or again, yeah, it was with a gaggle of other people, so... Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's so cool. Uh, I am hyped to learn about you. Uh, I'm going to be taking notes furiously as we go through this. And uh, I've already done a lot of research, like rereading your awesome article that's on Free Code Camp about your live stream, live coding setup. And uh, I'm going to be linking that and other cool things that Suze mentions in the show notes. But yeah, let's, let's get into it. Uh, I always like to start with just giving people perspective and understanding your kind of origin story as a developer because you have like a really interesting twisting and turning winding path through tech because you were in tech very early and then you just went and basically did like every single sub area of tech over the years it seems like <laughs> yeah really and and the other thing to note is i know i've been talking most of this podcast so far but if you heard some of what sue said she does have a little bit of a non-north american accent she hails from down mm -hmm. under yeah. So you're based in Melbourne? Yeah, that's right. Melbourne, Australia, which is southeast, kind of like on the way to Antarctica. So <laughs> <laughs> so you can kind of stop that's over. That's usually how I try stop. and describe it. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I had the pleasure of visiting Melbourne uh, a few years ago for a conference, and it was just, I love that city. My goodness. I'm not sure if I'll ever mm -hmm. go again, mm -hmm. just because it was a huge plane trip. To get over there from California, I it mean, like it was like a the longest flight I've ever taken was to Melbourne. I think, <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, like, what was it like growing up in Australia, and like, what were your early ambitions as a kid? I loved growing up here. I think I was definitely somebody who felt very lucky very very lucky and we we used to sort of affectionately refer to our country as the lucky country just because we knew if you were born here that you already had a really good head start in life um wasn't a very ambitious person you know like i you know even just growing up i didn't have huge travel aspirations or anything so it is funny in the end that i ended up living in um, in the United States for about 12 years. Um, yeah. but yeah, I just loved growing up here. This city has gotten the world's most livable city award, like years and years and years in a row. Um, it's just, it is actually a, an objectively good city, even though I'm very biased because I was born and raised here, but yeah, um, it, there, there's a reason why I'm living back here again. Right. And I haven't chosen elsewhere. So. Yeah. Well, what did you like? What were your early interests because i know like whenever i talk like you're like the third australian i've interviewed for like the re recent <laughs> recent history on the podcast and sure. uh it sounds like like a lot of the technology that we had in the states uh like a lot of like early apple computers uh commodore 64 amiga uh a lot of those computers like did you grow up did were you lucky enough to like have a computer in your home what type of gear were you working with yeah, that's a great question. So um, I know that a lot of that stuff originated in America, but it does kind of find its way to the, I guess, like secondary and tertiary markets. 
So um, my family growing up didn't have like a ton of money. Uh, we were, I was very fortunate to, to grow up middle class, but it's not like we could afford to buy like the brand new computers um, all the time. And it was sort of hard to justify buying one back then um, because it was, you know, the late eighties, early nineties, it was really only a few were very geeky about computers. Um, this was pre windows and all of that. So I was lucky enough to inherit a Commodore 64 from my uncle. And mind you, this was still, this was the early nineties. So we were starting to move into windows 3.1. Um, but I didn't care that it was behind. I didn't even know that it was a computer that was behind. Um, but given that there's no sort of GUI, there's the, all you do is type into a prompt, you know, I, yeah. I turned to my dad and said, how do you use this? It looks cool, but I don't know how to use it. And so he showed me a few prompts. Uh, he taught me a tiny bit of basic and then he just kind of left the, the, the computer manuals with me. Um, and I just got really hooked straight away. So I think that I was lucky in that I did inherit an older computer because I had to sort of learn computers like the hard way. Um, and so even when we moved into things like Windows 3.1, 95, 98, things like that, I was still trying to code, you know, um, regardless, because I found that that was quite interesting. Yeah. And was there anything that pushed you in like a creative direction? Like were, th were there some applications that you were using that like really, uh, at what point did you start saying, I want to learn more computers, learn more computers, more about computers. And I want this to be <laughs> like a thing that I do when I grow up. Did, was that like in your mind at all? Yeah, the last part was not in my mind at all. I just thought it was a fun hobby. Like, again, I'm not very ambitious. And so I just, I was just like, I like this computer, so I'm going to keep playing with it. But I think what really brought things home for me was once you, once batch files were a thing in Windows and you could start automating things, um, that's when I got really excited because, you know, you can set things up. So as soon as you log in to your account, you can run a batch file and that batch file will, you know, pop up all the different programs that are on games or like Windows Media Player or something. And I just thought that was so cool that you could, you know, just script something like that. Um, and then once I actually started getting onto the Internet, um, I would catch the bus to my local library because we didn't have the Internet at home. Um, I just thought websites were so cool and I figured out that you can actually make them. You know, I found a book in the library for kids called Your Own Website. Um, I actually ended up finding a copy um, years later for nostalgic reasons. But I looked at it and I was like, oh, you just type stuff in Notepad. This is actually like way easier than I thought it would be. And so I think my big moment was really learning how to use computers to do things for you. So it was like the batch files, but it was also making websites was just such a creative thing as a kid and then putting it on the internet, being able to tell your friends, they can go look at it at home as well. You know, there's something very magical about that experience, especially back then when not a lot of your friends actually had websites or, or you know, were interested in that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you got to be like the first kid on the block, so to speak, uh, or one of the first kids in your class that to have their own web presence, if you will. Yeah, it was exciting. It was like the late nineties and I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like, uh, at what point did you start thinking about like school beyond high school? Yeah. I originally wanted to be a veterinary nurse. Mm -hmm. Um, but I kind of just lost interest. Like I, I really like animals, but then I realized that it was going to be maybe a bit of a depressing job. Yeah. I think that unless you go on to become a full uh, veterinarian, you kind of don't have the nice jobs as a vet nurse. Um, so I sort of went back to the drawing board and I didn't really think of computers for the longest time until probably the last year of high school. And I had never heard of computer science. Um, I didn't hear of it until years and years later. And so I'm just, you know, looking in that you had this big reference book back then uh, in Australia of all of the different university courses you could take. And so it was a physical book that you, you, you sort of like palmed through. And I just kind of started looking up information technology and applying to random um, universities that way. But none of those courses were anything that I actually wanted to do. So to be honest, I was pretty lost and I didn't know if I could even get a job. You know, it was still just a hobby for me at that stage. So I sort of lucked out in the end, I think. <laughs> yeah. What did you end up doing, like in terms of studies? 
Yeah. So I got into like an information technology degree, but it was going to be like a, I think a two to three hour um, public transport ride there and back. So, you know, like four to six hours round trip every day. I just figured out that that just wasn't feasible. I wasn't ready to move out yet. So um, my mom actually saw like an advertisement in the local newspaper for a, um, I guess the equivalent in America is community college, but here it's yeah. called TAFE, which is tertiary and further education. So it's more of a trade school. Um, she found like an advertisement for like um, multimedia. It was a multimedia course. It's now been renamed to interactive media. And it just looked like everything I've ever wanted to do in one, right? It was like sound production and 3D modeling and um, video and making interactive games and making websites and things like that. So um, just got just just kind of just a spur of the moment thing. We went down to the school and applied and it was past the deadline and everything. But they actually let me in based on the websites I'd been making as a kid, you know. Um, so honestly, it was just very serendipitous because that course, that sort of two year um, associate of arts sort of put me on a good pathway for me, realizing that this might be a thing that I could do professionally. Yeah. And what kind of uh, skills did you walk out of that program with? We're, we're, and like, I don't want to gloss over the entire program because we've got so much to talk about. Mm. But like, yeah, uh, of course. while you're answering that question, just like any other like interesting kind of discoveries you had about yourself or about technology during those two years, uh, getting your associates. Yeah, I think what I found was that as long as it was creative, like it was as long as it was, a you know, using the computer in a creative sense, I would just really latch on and get very engaged um, with learning. But the course was not really learning any programming. There was a little bit of scripting in Flash, but it was mostly just doing everything else but programming, um, which sort of gives you this huge grab bag of skills that I've been able to reach into over and over again over my career and also in my personal life as well, you know, especially the the sound production, the video creation, you know, because we'll talk about that later, but even just the 3D modeling, you know, that came in way more useful in my life than I thought it ever would. Um, and so it was just good to learn a bunch of different things that I didn't even know was sort of, you know, a, a path of expertise just to get a sample of everything. So I sort of came out of that course as a very sort of well-rounded creative technologist, I guess you could say. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and it sounds almost kind of like the equivalent of like going to like video game design school or something like that is. Yeah, is... yeah. There was actually a video game track that they opened up later on. And I was really annoyed because they, they released that like a year into my course. And I was like, oh, do I switch to that one? That seems so cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, you've described your, uh, your education as a quote unquote jack of all trades. Um, and... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, could you talk about why this process was like a big asset, just having like such a grab bag of skills uh, and like what your first jobs like what they were after you finished this program? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it definitely set me up for um, my first couple of jobs. I was just sort of taking contract work for a little bit. And when you take contract work, you know, sometimes they will just ask if you, um, you know, if you can do this or do that and they sort of try and sort of use as many skills as they can um and so it meant that I could just jump from contract to contract and not worry about the fact that I was like very junior um because I could just sort of like use that jack of all trades to problem solve in in a lot of different cases and so for example you know one of my first jobs I was making flash banners for like a major car company and just making cars zoom around, you know, on, and I was yeah. that person that made the annoying ad banners that you saw on the early <laughs> internet, which, you like know, whenever I you arrive, now, and I'm quite ashamed. <laughs> yeah. So you arrive like at a website, the cleaning like, of the industry. Yeah. I was just thinking like, so for people that don't know uh, what Susie's talking about, like I just have these <laughs> memories of like, certainly the early two thousands, you you would arrive. My kids are like yelling something He's in, incomprehensible <laughs> about Sour Patch Kids. <laughs> Mom's coming to uh, escort them away from the premise. <laughs> All right. Uh, so what I was saying is, um, 
yeah, like I remember you'd like arrive at like IGN or like some video game website and like you'd be like, all right, I can't wait to read this article. Like all this stuff starts popping out, like all this animation. And, and of course, your, your mm-hmm, site, mm-hmm. like your internet connection starts chunking and everything is like super duper slow because this overly ambitious, you know, thing is like blocking your view of the article that you're trying to read. Exactly. So, so yeah. you were like developing that, those kinds of things for like advertising agencies or who, who were you working with? Yeah, so that was me. That was me making those annoying ads. And they were particularly animation heavy back then just to get the people's attention. Uh, It was the advertising agency, J. Walter Thompson. That's who I worked for early in my career. Um, And so, yeah, one day they'd say, we need you to do these flash banners. And then another day they'd say, oh, we have this... um, InDesign document that we're making into a PDF, but we want you to add sort of some interactive hotspots in it. Do you know how to do that? And then another time, you know, they'd be asking me to make this full on sort of immersive video website that where the video sort of blends in with the web page. And it was it was very sort of futuristic back then. Um, And so being being able to be on the video set as we were sort of filming and me having that background really helped me say, yes, this is something that I'll be able to blend in. And just having all of these different pieces of, um, even though it was all very surface level, obviously, right? Jack of all trades. There was just these really nice instinctive moments where I could come in and, and intuitively, you know, understand how something would be put together. And in the advertising agency world, that is just so bizarre, just really wild stuff happening all the time. Um, thinking on your feet was very high, highly valued at the time, I guess. Yeah. So a lot of people who are entering software development, like uh, the way I describe the Free Code Camp podcast audience is like one third developers, one third high school, university students, and one third people who are working in other fields that want to get into mm. software development. Maybe they're driving trucks. Maybe they are working as an accountant. Maybe they are uh, just coming out of rehab or coming out of incarceration or any number of different things. Right? Maybe they're just getting out of like a, a, you know, some sort of situation where they were previously like a stay-at-home spouse and now they have to re-enter mm. the workforce. Right. So like like there's mm-hmm, a mm-hmm. wide variety of people, and a lot of those people may have like skills from a past life, like they used to work in uh, one field or another, like as a developer, just day to day, do you find yourself calling on all these kind of random skills that at the time may, may have felt like, I'm not sure if I'm ever actually going to use this in a professional capacity. Like, have you, have you found just like random things that you picked up to continue to be useful and helpful for getting things done? Yeah, yes and no. I think it greatly depends on what your profession is. You know, like I think that there'll be little random things that come in handy. And obviously I can't comment on that because I haven't done a lot of those different careers, but um, just things from time to time. So for example, you know, I've never worked at a video game agency um, and I've never, you know, had to do anything professional in that capacity. But because we played with some of those physics a little bit in TAFE, Um, I've been able to just, you know, intuitively understand when a certain animation needs to happen on a website, when you're using CSS animations and like the, the tweening or the key, um, you know, creating the, I've just like drawn a blank. What are they called? The key, Key key keyframes. No, yeah. Keyframes. Is that like, like when you're like animating something like you, you kind of like, yeah, put the character in different shapes and then the software interpolates. Like what exactly the, the animation frames. is supposed yeah. to happen? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't exactly. know anything about animation. So, I just got lucky and knew that form, that term. <laughs> yeah, okay. exactly. And so that stuff came along for web pages like years and years and years later, right? Like Flash was already dead. I thought, okay, I'm never going to use any of those skills ever again. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, we had things like keyframes and CSS, and I'm like, oh my god, you know, I can actually use that now. Or even when 3JS came to um, the web, right. Um, in JavaScript, you know, I was at a hackathon once and, um, somebody wanted to create this sort of like 3d lathing system. And, you know, I already had some of the kind of theory on that, even just like calculating the frost room and things like that. And, you know, for actually programmatically creating it, even though I'd never touched programmatic 3d modeling, I had that, you know, intuitive background where I could figure things out. And I sort of had that, 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 you know, reasoning in order to problem solve. So it hasn't come in handy all the time, 
but it sort of surprises me when it does because it does tend to be quite spontaneous like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. It, it sounds like this uh, broad skill set has been very helpful. So from developing, uh, you know, banner ads and, and other things that advertising agencies needed, like like where did you move from there in terms of like the, what was the next step, step in your career? Yeah, advertising was definitely not for me. Like if you've seen Mad Men, um, it's very yeah, much I love like Mad that. Men. <laughs> I love, I love that show. We yeah. talk about that often. It's like my favorite show of all time. But I would never want to live oh, in that that's, world. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, exactly. It is funny that it's one of your favorite shows. But yeah, it, it was very much like that, right? Like every every agency is its own flavor of that depending on the decade. And like, you know, there's just different, slight different nuances to it. It just wasn't for me. I think I was there for maybe a year, a year and a half or something. I forget. But I just wanted something a bit more quiet. Um, and something that wasn't advertising, it just didn't sit with me. You know, I just was like, I don't like making these annoying things that people have to run into on the internet. Right. It just didn't feel right. So, um, I ended up just pivoting into different roles. So I moved into e-learning next. Um, I was actually teaching part-time, um, the back at the, the TAFE, the university that I studied at, I went back to teach for three years to part-time. So I just moved right into education, actually. So I was sort of, I was doing QA and accessibility testing for a bunch of e-learning tools that are used in various TAFE institutions in Australia. And then, yeah, I would then go and moonlight as a teacher. And so that was nice. And then I just worked for a bunch of web shops, right? Like consultancies and stuff before, you know, working for more SaaS um, companies later in the last, in the, sorry, in the, the second part of my career so far. So it yeah. was just kind of stumbling around trying to find stuff that, you know, was was a bit more morally in line with what I wanted to work on. Yeah. So you had problems with like working in the advertising agent uh, agency industry, if you will. I mean, that whole mm. industry mm-hmm. is based around like manufacturing desire of products that people don't necessarily need, right? <laughs> getting them to spend money, getting people yeah, to potentially go into debt. Wrong. Lots of products that are very bad for obviously Mad Men. The whole the whole theme going through the entire series. This isn't a big spoiler because it, it comes up in the very first episode. Is cigarettes, <laughs> right? Like cigarettes are an unnecessary thing that are incredibly damaging <laughs> to people. Yeah, like they're exactly. damaging to the environment. They're damaging, to, obviously, to public health. Like uh, a huge portion of my tax dollars that I pay are going to help people who smoked a bunch of cigarettes and are now need all this end of life care that's caused by that and. You know, like, man, like Don Draper, the main character himself is like addicted to smoking and he can't quit. And he just kind of like accepts. That's that's one of the things I love about Mad Men. Sorry to go off on a Mad Men tangent, but like it was no, just no, like no, I get it. inconceivable that you could actually quit. And he's just like really pissed off at the cigarette companies whom he's been benefiting from his entire career as an advertiser, advertising executive. Right. Um, he's just upset, like, because he realizes, like, I'm hooked. This is going to kill me and I can't quit. <laughs> like. I, I'm just going to be addicted to this for the rest of my life. He feels like he's been hoodwinked, essentially. And it's like kind of like the, it, it's like this angry chip on his shoulder throughout the series. But, um, but yeah, like I, I can totally see, like I have lots of friends who are in advertising and not everybody's advertising something as damaging as cigarettes, but I can, I can, I can still see, like mm-hmm. maybe you could talk about that. Like, don't worry about slighting <laughs> the advertising industry. Just talk about like how you really feel about the field having worked in it like were there any moments where you really felt you look back and you regret doing certain things that you did mm, yeah it's good because i i it's a good question because i did go in very naive right and the that was sort of the job to get back in the day if you um were kind of more on the creative side of software as well um and so it was so exciting you know i was competing with other graduates in my class for that job like we all wanted that job so badly and so to be honest you know I think there are a lot of parallels with that nowadays in certain jobs that seem really cool but might be a bit morally questionable Um, but that was my first experience with it really opened my eyes I don't know it was just working in advertising was really cool for a lot of different reasons it was very like fast-paced you know there were times when we were pulling all-nighters to Um, pitch to to win a certain account you know like there was this big lottery account that we were trying to win 
and we made their entire pit into a huge game show in one of the meeting rooms so we converted one of the rooms into a massive game show and everyone had to dress up and you know and so I was being picked up at four in the morning to come and work on the interactive PDF because, you know, that's when the designers actually finally finished the work and went to bed, right? And then I got the phone call in the middle of the night. And that's like really, really bad, right? That's a very bad thing and we don't encourage that. But that was sort of the adrenaline rush of working in advertising where sometimes you get a bit Stockholm syndromed in where you're all in it together, you know? And so it's exciting and we might win the pitch and things like that. And you sort of feel like you're part of something. Um, and so I would say that it was just very mixed. I wasn't always creating annoying, crappy things that yeah. were distracting people and trying to convince them to buy stuff on the internet. There were other aspects of it um, that I found really fun. And we did create just websites for um, brands as well, where, you know, the, 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 the actual user had to want to go to the website. They had to want to go to Kellogg's.com or something and, you know, visit that website. And so we weren't sort of annoying them in that way. And so I would just say it was mixed, but after I left, I definitely regretted that I added to the advertising on the internet because I think that back then it was pretty simple. There wasn't, there, there was no such thing as tracking pixels and things like that, at least when I first started. But by the time I moved to the industry and I saw how much more creepy and manipulative advertising was getting, that's when I started feeling embarrassed that I was sort of part of the beginnings of it, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, that totally makes sense because like ad tech, advertising technology, like being able, like there've been a lot of breakthroughs in trying to successfully get you to part with your money mm -hmm. really, or, or to make some sort of big purchasing decision on behalf of your company, mm. whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and the thing that uh, it works, right? Like, if you go raise a bunch of venture capital and you have this war chest, uh, you can go out and you can pretty much guaranteed get customers through running Google ads or Facebook ads, right? And uh, yep. because there's just this big audience and you can go through and you can micro target and you can A-B test and you can just kind of use these different processes to arrive at an ad that will convert. Um, were you involved in any of that stuff or did that, that come later after you got out of the industry? Yeah, thankfully I wasn't involved with that. Um, and back then, because internet speeds were so slow, especially in Australia, you know, we were required to keep those flash banners really small. Like I submitted, I uploaded one to, you know, the marketing platform once and I got a, this was back in the day we had a phone on your desk too. Yeah. <laughs> like I would get a call from the guy at the marketing agency, totally separate from the advertising agency. And he'd be like, yeah, so your flash banner was 16 kilobytes, but we need it to be 15. <laughs> and so, you know, we, we did have razor thin file size margins back then. And that's quite hard to do when you have like a car asset and the JPEG background for it and a bunch of text and a bunch of keyframes and things like that. So you had to get so, really creative. Um, you know, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, you had to get really creative really as into, far like, as optimization. Like, yeah. Sorry, yeah, exactly. I didn't mean to interrupt you. By um, the way, so like, there's like a big time difference between Texas <laughs> and Melbourne. Uh, so if it seems like I'm interrupting Suze or if Suze is taking a little longer to react, like it's hard to get much farther around the earth than you and I are right now when we're talking to one another. So I just, yeah, it's for, true. The, for the sake it's of the true. audience. I'm hardwired into the ethernet. Yeah, yeah, me too. Sorry, I've got like I 500 it, megabits. Sorry. Like super duper fast internet. You've got super duper fast internet. The physical distance, the packets need to travel is just so long. <laughs> so sorry. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, well, back, my back to what you were saying. not that fast anyway. Um, yes. Yeah. So, you know, you, you really had to creatively optimize that kind of stuff. And I felt that that was at least considerate, right? Where you didn't want to encroach on the user. You didn't want them to have to pay extra for like downloading extra stuff, junk. Uh, and so back then, um, as well this was when i was doing this right when facebook had just launched publicly right and i would say that facebook has been responsible for a lot of the really creepy and really manipulative advertising right you know and i, I think that was sort of the dawn of the more sophisticated advertising the same with google when gmail came out and they started advertising on you know the adsense the keywords and things it was right at the dawn of that so thankfully i didn't get to be part of that you know i'd left and it's not as if i saw that and thought oh, i'm getting out i don't like it obviously it took me took us all a few years to really understand what was going on 
and and for those t those really creepy tactics to come out um but yeah i was lucky enough that i sort of don't really attach myself to that but i just yeah, yeah still feel a bit dodgy all the same yeah so where do you go from there like like you've got these skills uh but you're kind of disenchanted with the industry that you're in so so you, uh, you said you went back to school uh, which is really cool by the way like going to teach i heard that you kind of even helped rewrite some of the curriculum that you yourself learned when you were at uh, uh i'm gonna get the uh, the acronym wrong uh the community college TAFE. equivalent in Aust tafe yes uh mm -hmm. yeah like did teaching did that like fire you up did you enjoy teaching yeah, I did actually. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm not sure why. I just really liked, you know, I mean, you, you're the perfect person to talk to about this. Um, you know, you know, when you get that, you see that light bulb go off on, in someone and, you know, you, you see them actually like really enjoy what they're learning and they feel like, oh, I can actually do this too. And it's the same as like any hobby. Like I think any hobby that you do, most people are very, very happy to teach somebody else because just bringing them in and, and sharing that joy with someone is really, really great. So that was something that I think was what motivated me um, to teach. I wanted to spread the same joy that I felt when I sat down at the Commodore 64 for the first time. Um, and I rewrote the curriculum mostly just because uh, when we did our web design three semester, uh, it was using a Microsoft Access database and Cold Fusion, and uh, that was sort of starting to become uh, just old legacy kind of software. And so yeah. I thought this isn't preparing people for the workplace very well. So I rewrote it in PHP, and basically the um, we did the WAMP stack in the end, so the Windows, uh, Apache, uh, MySQL, and um, PHP stack. Yeah. So I just rewrote the whole curriculum to do that. And instead of creating, um, I forget what we actually made in that Cold Fusion class, but I said, okay, everyone's going to make a blog. And then you can use that also as your portfolio if you want when you graduate. Um, because back then you had to actually show portfolios to get web jobs. You weren't doing like leak code or hacker rank or anything like yeah. that, right? Um, and so I just rewrote it to make it more useful for them when they graduated. And I just thought that Cold Fusion and Access was just not going to be the way going forward. So that was the main reason why I rewrote it. I just thought it would be more engaging that way. Yeah. Well, I, I do want to get to live coding. Uh, before we get to live coding, though, um, I mean, again, I'm trying to, like, piece together the chronology of your career in real time. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, uh, but, like, teaching and live coding have got to be pretty related. Like, those skills that you got helping light yeah, bulbs go off in people's heads, like, face-to-face, mm. mm. -face, and now you're jumping on Twitch and you're basically just coding live right there in like Vim and like showing people everything you're doing and explaining what you're doing and talking out loud, thinking out loud and interacting with chat and stuff. Maybe you can talk about the process of getting into live coding. What inspired you to first start doing it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I got inspired by the people that were doing it really early on. So um, Casey from Hand Handmade Hero, um, he, I think was one of the very, very first to do it. Um, but I think what gave me the boot up the bum, so to speak, to, to actually try it myself was I had a friend who was doing, um, he was doing open source and he just, I think he just did YouTube live or something like that. I forget what he did, but he just, um, I just don't want to put him on blast. So I'm just giving him some privacy by not calling out who they are. But um, he just did some open source. He's like, hi, you know, I work on, I'm helping to maintain PouchDB. I'm just like, you know, I just need to do some open source work. I just want you to show, I just want to show people like, what is it like to actually maintain open source? Because I think there's a lot of sort of misconceptions at the time. You know, I think this was back in 2015, 2014. There were just a lot of misconceptions about open source and contributing to it. And, you know, a lot of people sort of put open source maintainers on a big platform and found them intimidating. So he's just like, oh, just, you know, just sit and watch what I do for an hour and watch me flipping through issues and closing them out or replying to them. And he was also just showing that there's a lot of drudgery in it. It's not just like heroic coding and pushing up pull requests. <laughs> you know, there's also just a lot of staring at something and figuring out if it is a bug or not, or like answering somebody, you know, back and forth in an issue. So 
I just thought that was really interesting. I really appreciated it at the time because all of the open source stuff I did was so small and it was only me. And so seeing someone maintain something big that everyone sort of had to collaborate on, I thought was really interesting. So I remember putting a comment on his YouTube video saying, this is actually really cool. Maybe I could do the same for my embedded hardware libraries because people are scared of those kinds of projects. And maybe I can show people that it's really not a big deal. It's just still JavaScript at the end of the day that you're writing. So that was the kind of origin story of why I started. I was literally like, hey, I found this useful. Maybe I'll do my own version of it that sort of sheds some of the intimidation factor for like a slightly different angle, you know? Yeah. And we didn't really even get into like your love of embedded development, but like you've been very mm. vocal about that um, over the years, like mm -hmm. being really into like building things, like physical hardware, mm -hmm. <laughs> like like, uh, you know, like, I think you, you had like the Adafruit, like, you know, chip set of the month thing or something, the box that oh, they would yeah, send you. Oh, yeah, that was so cool. The monthly boxes. Yeah, that was so cool. Yeah, Adafruit is like the Raspberry Pi company, right? Like they they, they ship out Raspberry Pis? No, that's Element 14. That's but Element they, 14. They do, do, they do make their own stuff. Yeah. Okay. So they make their own boards and um, things like that. Yeah, Adafruit are amazing. They're based out of New York. So... And, and you've got like quite a bit like, I mean, you're kind of blocking it in the frame for people who are watching the video. They can see oh. you've got like a, a detailed workbench, like a pegboard. Yeah. Is that like a, some sort of like, uh, you know, CNC machine or something or a 3D printer? What is that big thing behind you? The big boxy thing? Yeah. yeah. So that's a, it's a 3D printer, laser cutter and CNC machine oh, wow. in one. Um, yeah. It's really cool. It's very big. It's very heavy. I had to actually, um, so I, I bought that as an Ikea table, you know, with the legs and everything, but I had to then go and buy a new tabletop, like basically a huge slab of, uh, plywood from the hardware store and paint it just to be able to support the weight of it, <laughs> Yeah, which is quite funny, but yeah. So, um, I am really interested in that and I've always been interested in that. And that's because of it. Again, a teacher in my TAFE course one day brought in an arcade cabinet that he'd built from scratch. Um, and it was amazing. It was like the sit down coffee table one and the cocktail. he showed table. us how, ba yeah. Uh, is that what they're called? A cocktail? I mean, that's what they're called in the table. States, like cocktail model. It's like basically like Pac-Man or something where you've got one controller on each side. And the screen kind of flips. Yeah, depending yeah, yeah. On that's exactly playing. what it was. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It was really cool. Um, so he made one of those and he just asked people if they were interested to come in on a Saturday. So we all came in on a Saturday and he just grabbed it out of the back of his car and he took the whole thing apart and showed us how it works. And back then there was no Arduino. So what you did was you took the circuit boards out of keyboards, old recycled keyboards, computer keyboards. And then you just like kind of um, hacked them and soldered your own sort of uh, wires to different, you know, parts of the keyboard matrix. And you use that to then, you know, solder your joystick buttons and, and things like that to the actual, um, yeah, to the actual arcade machine. And so, you know, he was showing us how to do all of this. And he's like, here's how to avoid all the ghosting problems on your keyboard, because back then there were ghosting issues. What is ghosting um, exactly? It, I just thought that was the... Yeah, so ghosting used to be a thing on um, old school keyboards, like the PS2 connected keyboards, where because like keyboards are sort of like on a, on a circuit matrix, if you pushed certain key combinations too fast, you'd either get the wrong keystroke or you wouldn't, the keystroke wouldn't register. I can't remember exactly just because I haven't needed this knowledge for a long time, but it was called ghosting where you'd either get the wrong key press or you'd get like a, a, another different random letter because of um, certain letters having certain uh, or certain keys having certain relationships in the electronic circuit um, where it would just cause issues. So um I guess crossed wires, so to speak. So yeah. it was really interesting. So he would he would show us how to kind of pick the different letters on the keyboard to avoid the ghosting issues when people were playing a video game, because obviously that would be very frustrating. So sorry, that was a really long story, but that was sort of how I got involved in it. And I remember I started like I started collecting all these old keyboards. I was that person that was like, yes, and then I'm going to make something with them. These, you know, and then a few years later, the Arduino came out, and I was like, oh, this this is what we needed this whole time. So then I went and did an Arduino course in Sydney. 
Um, and the rest was kind of history. I think this was 2006, 2007, I did that. And then I just started playing with embedded stuff like in my spare time for, for basically every year since. Yeah, and so like even today, you still will like bust out like gear and just start hardware hacking? Yeah, so I don't have a lot of time these days just because I went back to uni, which we'll talk about later. But yeah. um, I still, like, make stuff. Like, I'm just going to grab something. Don't judge me because I'm wearing my slippers because it's cold. <laughs> no worries. And I'm going to verbally describe So She's got a big room. She's walking across it. Uh, she's got, again, this beautiful white workbench uh, with, like, perfectly spaced mm -hmm. and, like, like, very deliberately planned out, like, where you're going to put your drill and where you're going to put all your different... <laughs> You know, screwdrivers and stuff. It's, it's a really cool looking mm -hmm. uh, backdrop. Uh, so she's back in her chair. Because <laughs> a lot of people, like half the people. I'm really lucky watch to on, have this. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no. Go on. I was just going to say, because like about half the people that listen to the, like maybe a little more than half of the people will just listen to the audio edition. Like I just listen to the audio edition. Um, I don't usually watch the video. But for those of people who are watching the video edition, yes, we do have a video edition on YouTube. You can go there and you can see what Suze's background is. Or if you've got like a, a photo, if you want to just snap a quick photo of it, I can just throw it up in the show notes and people can like link directly to the photo. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. she's giving me the thumbs up. So it sounds like we're going to have a cool workspace photo. We might, if you take a good one, like, and we can get it into a square, we could even potentially put you at your desk on the Instagram because Freeco Camp does have an Instagram. It's about, you know, it, I don't know. We've got maybe like several hundred images of people in their work workbenches and stuff so proud of it um but yes what'd you grab show us yeah so i'm really lucky to have that space behind me by the way <laughs> um so i'll just describe it again for the audio people this is something that i made years and years ago but i actually got it out recently just to repair it because it broke when you know one of my moves that i did um so it's supposed to be like a a, a, a one to one sized replica of the metro card from new york city subway so it's ah. like a train ticket and so the actual silk screen on the um circuit board is supposed to look exactly like it you've got the magnetic strip here which is silk screened in like a big white strip um and so it's got like a little greeting card sticker that i uh, sorry speaker that you can take just out of a, one of those musical greeting cards um and it has like a little um 3d printed sort of like gramophone style sort of you know that horn shape yeah so it's just supposed to play train noises <laughs> that's literally all it does um but it it sort of shows the different skills that come together right and why i have a 3d printer just so you can do that um and you know the soldering iron behind me you know i use that to actually repair it so the speaker actually broke off um and the wire snapped as well so i resoldered that together glued this back down with a little bit of super glue and then it's it's good to go again so, awesome. so that's just an example so does it make sound little things like that will it work right now yeah i don't know if you'll be able to hear it because it's very soft because it's it really not an mic, amplified it's, it's, speaker yeah. okay That's pretty cool. That. <laughs> yeah, that, that came through fine, I think. So uh, it just so, does the, you know, stand clear of the closing doors. And that was a noise that I heard every day in New York City when I lived there. So it makes me very nostalgic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I love it. Like, on the note of geeking out about mass transit, I love mass transit. Whenever I go to a new city, I love to, like, just take their train system around. Of course, I live in a city that yeah, doesn't same. even have a train system, unfortunately. Well, <laughs> technically we do. It's just like... <laughs> I, I've never used it before because it only goes in like to certain parts of town that I've never even been to. Basically, like, mm -hmm. you can take it to mm -hmm. get to like the the fairgrounds, basically where they have the the Texas State Fair with the giant cowboy guy, big Tex. <laughs> but that's it, <laughs> and I've never gotten an opportunity to ride it. Anyway, sorry for the the <laughs> you know tangent about mass transit, but yeah, like so you're building things. Uh, you're, you're, fi you're feeling inspiration and you're just like, you have the skills and you have the gear to be able to like 3d print things or use subtractive, you know, um, technology like CNC to get metal into a certain shape that you need it. Um, so you, you have your own kind of hardware lab that you can go into and get things done with. Yeah. That's what I call it behind me. The lab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are there so what's the most ambitious hardware project you've worked on? 
Ähm. This is going to sound unexpected, but I, it was actually when I was working for Microsoft, um, I was trying to, I was working with like a medical, medical equipment company for the mm -hmm. HoloLens. Okay. So HoloLens, I guess that's the, Microsoft's the VR goggles, version. The AR yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say that that's embedded because it was like an actual kind of wearable device. Right. And we were trying to um, basically set up like the beginnings of what sort of live streamed 3D virtual experiences, right? So let's say we had something. So the HoloLens is not like the um, some of the other virtual reality headsets, um, although it's mixed reality. It Everything, all the processing was on the actual device. So you didn't connect it to a computer like the Oculus or whatever, right? So it couldn't, you know, it didn't have as much power as something like an Oculus Rift. Uh, and so if, if something, if we had to do like 3D manipulations or something like that, that were like really, really processor intensive, we couldn't do it on the device. So we were trying to figure out a way to um, use like streaming technology. Um, and I think we were trying to do it over RTC, I think, um, and DirectX. We were trying to figure out how to actually like have this very sort of zero latency, you know, like the sensors in the HoloLens would, would transmit over that RTC channel, the data channel over to the server. Then the server would use DirectX to render the actual 3D view based on how you moved your head and then like whip it back to the machine to render as quickly as possible. And so I thought that was probably one of the more challenging things that I've worked on because I had to like learn a lot. I mean, I'd never worked with RTC before um, and I just had to just really think about how to optimize things as much as possible and just the concept of real-time streaming was sort of new back then you know i don't think stadia was was a thing and i don't think amazon's version of game streaming was a thing so for us we were like is it even actually possible like are we going to achieve the latency we want without making people feel motion sick right with that sort of slight delay so i thought that was actually a really interesting project that i worked on yeah what was the result were you able to figure out a way to do it in a way that didn't make people motion sick yeah so we were able to finish the prototype and the job that i was in at the time that's all we kind of got to do yeah we're like here's the prototype we've validated it and then you just kind of move on so i'm not sure what actually happened to that, given that that it's proprietary and sort of like not sort of public so yeah yeah you've worked at a lot of big tech companies and i, I will get back to live coding but like since you mentioned your work at microsoft <laughs> you worked at like zappos which is like mm -hmm. part of amazon uh famously like mm -hmm. the customer focused company uh, i'd i'd be excited to hear about your time at zappos because it's such a unique company um and then you mm. worked at stripe you worked at crowdstrike you, you worked at like a lot of the big name brand kind of like a, as uh cassidy williams says you're you're like gradually filling your infinity stones into your infinity gauntlet of like the different <laughs> big tech companies you worked at i don't know if that's actually a goal of yours yeah. but cassidy thought that was like a funny thing that her sister had done she'd worked at like all the different fan companies but uh what was your time at Zappos like? Yeah, not a lot of people ask about that, so I appreciate that. Um, it was my first job in the US, and I was moving to Las Vegas, so like there weren't really a lot of places to apply for jobs there, and I was just like, I w someone told me about Zappos because they'd just been bought by Amazon. They're not a thing in Australia; you don't like order from Zappos.com or anything. And they're just like, oh, it's sort of a bit kooky there. It's quite creative. You know, I think that it fits your personality. You should totally apply. And it was a total moonshot. Um, but I managed to get a job there. And I was there for almost four years. And it was wild. Um, probably one of the most formative jobs that I've had in my career, just because of the timing of it. And when it was good, it was really good. Um, a lot of the Amazon stuff started, some of that culture started seeping in towards the end, which was why I left. But the first two or three years were, again, just really formative, very influential on me. The front end team there at the time was world class. I mean, like world class. Um, you know, they cared a lot about performance, which is 
something that I'd never really had to um, worry about in my career to a degree. Like I worked for mostly advertising consulting. So you just created a website for your client and then you handed it off and you never saw it again, you know, and they were very simple websites. They weren't super JavaScript heavy, maybe some Google Maps. (laughs) And that was about it. Um, And so I hadn't really written a lot of JavaScript either. So I wouldn't know the first thing about performance. And so I learned so many things in that job and the front end team were just so talented and so nice um, and so inspiring. And so I think that was when I went from just stumbling through my career to, oh, I actually want to be on this level. I want to be at this caliber. And it really sort of pushed me to improve a lot. So um, even just outside of the really cool culture of Zappos, where it's very creative, all the meeting rooms are really zany and you know, the CEO uh, at the time was was quite a character. I just found it really inspiring because of the front end team. Like they really brought me up to the next level of skills. Yeah. So it, what was it like moving to the States? I mean, a, a huge portion of the people listening to this podcast are from overseas and a lot of them would love to come and work for one of the big, frankly, like high paying US tech companies because uh, Americans mm-hmm. may take this for granted that like tech jobs just pay a, a lot of money, uh, often like a lot more than, yeah. you know, working in accounting or working in other not like non software engineering fields of engineering, for example. Uh, but like moving to the U S from Australia, like there are lots of cultural differences, even though you got the same language and everything. Like had, had you been to the U S before you came to, uh, apply, this was your first trip to the U S really? No. um i'd been to i'd been overseas once i went to vanuatu which is just an an island off the you know a few hours from the coast of uh northeastern australia no i'd never been to america um my partner scored a job in nevada and so it was more just like we were going for his job but I quickly discovered that you can't just move to America. Like you sort of have to have a visa and that usually means you have to have a job. Um, and so that was the reason why I moved overseas. Um, but yeah, the I actually took a pay cut um, because at the time, like Nevada was really low cost of living and the front end engineers at Zappos weren't valued in the same way. They, they were seen as less technical than the back-end engineers. So we got paid a lot less than some of the other engineers at the company. They then corrected that a few years later. But I took a pay cut actually to go work in America, which I know is not the usual path. But after that, obviously like my, the, the jobs I got after that, and especially at some of the larger tech companies, obviously I started earning a lot more money there. So it was a wild experience to go from you know, being on a salary that I was relatively comfortable with, but had to sort of budget carefully and things like that, right? And couldn't live outside my means to then being on salaries that were just almost uncomfortable for me, you know, because I just thought it was so much money. Um, Really wild experience, very challenging to get through the first set of immigration paperwork as well. I wasn't prepared for that and that was quite stressful. So for anyone who has that in mind, that's something to expect. How long did you live in the U.S. total? 12 years i think yeah did you get like a did you apply for like a green card or any sort of permanent residency or did you always have the plan to go back to australia yeah it sort of flip-flopped a lot when i first moved there it was only going to be for a year and then i thought i'll stay a few years but i'm definitely going back (laughs) um and then i kept staying and i've been in some long-term romantic relationships over there right so if i was in a long-term relationship at the time i thought oh well this sort of is giving me some incentive to actually stay. Um, And so at some point, you know, I did start working on a green card application just to make things a bit easier for myself because it's really stressful to know that when you lose your job or if you quit, you need one immediately or you have to basically deport yourself. Um, And I found that enormously stressful. It was always a big thing in my head. I felt like I couldn't really buy property or do anything permanent there until I had that permanent residency. So I did actually spend a number of years trying and failing to get a green card. It's not as easy as it sounds. And some people just have a much harder time than other people. Sometimes it's just really bad luck, but I never really got there. So for that entire 12 years, I was sort of precariously on a a work visa. But I think that's very normal for people from uh, um, countries like India, where the green card applications are oversaturated in for their quota. 
Um, so it's not as if, you know, that's a unique experience. I know some people that are waiting, you know, 20 to 30 years for their green card. So um, I don't want to trivialize that either. But I was in a similar situation where I just felt like I kept running into dead ends or, you know, the pandemic happened, which put a hold on a lot of um, green card applications. I know that right now because of all the layoffs in tech, most companies have to pause their green card applications for everyone because the market's too saturated with um, American citizens. So uh, because of the process, you can't justify hiring somebody from overseas. So it's it's just a very fraught process. Um, but I did try uh, to get there. It just didn't happen. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, how do you feel? I mean, it's not too bad, too bad of a fallback plan moving to the world's most livable city where you happen to also have grown up. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I come from a lot of privilege. And so, you know, there was a point where I realized that it wasn't worth all the trade-offs, but also I come from a, an, an amazing country. And so, you know, having that up my sleeve was always something that was obviously very comforting for me. So, yeah, that helped a lot. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so again, you worked at a lot of big tech companies. You got to like learn JavaScript from people who were underappreciated by, you know, Zappos in terms of compensation <laughs> and stuff, but, but who took their job very seriously. And it sounds like they were on the pioneering edge of what was being done with front end development at the time. So you learned a lot mm -hmm. of skills and I do want to get back to live coding. It's such an interesting topic. Uh, <laughs> at what point did you start live coding? This was, I think like 2016, 2017-ish. Do you know when you started actually live coding? 2016, I think. I think 2016? Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Um, yeah, no, I just gave it a go. And I just told a couple of people on social media and my family I was doing it. And I think like three to five people showed up for that first one. And uh, I remember rehearsing it the night before because I was so nervous to live code. Um, I was like, oh, I need to actually have some idea of what I'm doing. Otherwise, I'm just going to like draw a massive blank. So, uh, yeah, that was sort of when I started. And then I ended up just finding it a really good excuse to work on open source tasks that I needed to do, but I didn't really feel like doing. So that's kind of why it continued. I was like, oh, this is actually like really helpful for me. And hopefully if people watch, that's a bonus. So that was sort of how I got started with it. Yeah. And maybe you can talk about what like a typical session would be like when you sat down and I realized that you haven't streamed in like three years. If you go to <laughs> no op cat, <laughs> twitch.com slash no uh, which is your, your old handle N O O P K A T, I believe. Um, K -A -T, yep. yeah. Uh, there's, it just, there's like literally nothing there. It just says last streamed three years ago <laughs> and there's no like vi video <laughs> on demand. It's like, it, uh, and I went there and I was just like, oh, I really wanted to watch your old streams in preparation for this, but I don't, I don't know if any of those were preserved anywhere. Is it just lost to time or do you have like some hard drive with all the. They're all in the hard drive. Um, okay. So cool. I was very diligent about backing them up and things like that. So they're not lost to time. They're just not online. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, um, what was it like? Like those, you did it for a few years, I think. Uh, like, do you remember how regularly you were, like how it progressed, um, just what the experience was like. Cause live coding is seeing kind of a resurgence. Like I was just talking with the primogen like last week and, uh, he, he's mm -hmm. a YouTube mm -hmm. or he, he, he records on Twitch and then he takes it, chops it up and has an editor that puts it onto YouTube. And he's very, um, mm -hmm. I think deliberate about how he approaches it. But, um, you know, the way that you were doing it was it, when I, when I watched it back in the day, it felt very, very different vibe. It was much more chill, uh, much less like social commentary. It was much, much more just like a, a love of the craft and just like focusing on the code. I didn't, it didn't seem like there were nearly as many memes or inside jokes or anything. It just seemed very wholesome. Is that how you remember it? Yeah, that's, that's how I remember it. I think it was different days back then, but also I think I had different motivations, but I don't want to speak for the other streamers. So I yeah, won't yeah, sort of yeah. elaborate on that. I just think that I came in with it, with those different motivations. I only did it once a week, which is not something that Twitch really likes you to do. They want you to do it more often, but I just knew that that was sustainable. Two hours every Sunday morning was when I did it. Um, and I usually, so for the first few, 
I would just pick a feature I wanted to implement in a open, in an open source library. Then after that, I was like, I need to make this even more sustainable for myself and enjoyable. And so that I don't have to spend hours grinding before, you know, to figure out what I want to do. I would just literally like roll out of bed, put clothes on, put a, put a little bit of makeup on and then show up and say, all right, let's look through the issues. And maybe the night before, if I was particularly drawing a blank on like, I don't even know what I'd work on. I'd go through the, the issues and, uh, you know, on one of my repos and, and sort of think, okay, has someone opened a pull request? Sometimes someone would actually open a pull request the night before and I could tell they would have hoping I'd review it on the stream. So, you know, I tried to sort of look for something to prioritize, um, you know, as far as that went. So it was a very different vibe. Um, we did have only a couple of inside jokes, but they weren't sort of, we would always explain them and, you know, we, they were very subtle anyway. Um, and so it was just, it was supposed to be cozy time. It wasn't my intention. I never really designed my stream in, to be a certain way. I just wanted to show up, be myself, not be a character, get some work done, you know, that kind of thing. So. Yeah. And it was practical in the sense that you were actually working on real stuff that you'd be interested in working on. Like even if you weren't streaming, uh, open source. Yeah. yeah, pretty much. What role has open source played in your career and in your life? A lot. Yeah, I actually feel really bad because I, when I, so I streamed for five years and then I decided to just sort of step away um, from it for a lot of different reasons. Um, you know, none of them were like really negative reasons or anything. And I stopped working on open source too. It's like I didn't have that sort of reason to get up and do it on the weekend. So I feel bad. I have stepped away from that a bit. It is something I want to get back into this year. Um, but it's had a huge impact on my life um, in a lot of different ways. And it's again, it wasn't something that I designed. I did open source because I saw other people around me doing it. And I thought it was a really cool just concept in general. Right. And I thought it was again, it was a, just a, a, a very admirable um, thing to do. And I wanted to be sort of part of that and contribute, you know, my perspective on embedded software and things like that. And, and you know, it's a really lovely way to meet a community um, and hopefully inspire other people too. And so, but through that, you know, I accidentally got introduced to all sorts of employment opportunities and even the live coding, you know, I had a couple of years in, in developer relations as a result of that because people saw my stuff and reached out and wanted to hire me. And so there was a lot of unintentional benefits to it, a lot of amazing privileges that I don't think I would have foreseen that I know that some people getting into streaming now, they do it with the aim of achieving those things because they can see that it's possible. But it was very surprising to me how much the stuff I was just doing for myself ended up sort of being noticed by other people and, and, and opened a lot of doors for me that I didn't necessarily, um, you know, plan for, which is awesome. But it's been mostly jobs and just meeting new people and being able to speak at conferences and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Well, I want to talk a little bit about like more recently, since you stepped away from live coding, uh, you know, recently you've gone and you've got like a whole lot of different CompTIA certifications. You went back and you got like a proper like four year degree from Western governors university where Bo Carnes studied where several people who've been on the free Camp podcast mm -hmm. got their undergrad in uh, computer science. Uh, maybe you can talk about like the back to school back, like hitting the books again, because you had like this pretty, you were really high up in your career and from the outside, from my perspective, it sounds like you're like, hey, I want to climb down this ladder and I want to go climb up this ladder, like this person against a different bookshelf almost. That's, that's kind of how I view it. Is that <laughs> an accurate representation of well, what was going through your mind? You didn't want to like just stay in sort this of, one field? Really. Okay. Sort of. Um, I think that I see school in a different way to most people do. I know that school is or school, I guess like college or university, I know that it's very heavily um, focused on like workplace, career, finding a job, things like that. Um, but I love learning and I love having a structured learning environment. And because I had such an amazing experience with that TAFE course, I just it just really engaged me. Um, I still wanted to actually go and get a full degree. So that is what's called an advanced diploma here um, in interactive media. That's what I technically have, but it's not the same. Like I always felt like I missed out because I just like didn't end up going to 
college and getting an actual degree. I just felt that that is a an experience for me that I would just really cherish and enjoy and and it had nothing to do with a career or anything like that. It's just it felt like such a luxury indulgence almost to be able to go to a place that is catering for you to learn things. There are experts there that you can talk to and it is a structured environment so that you understand what you you don't have to figure out what you don't know because a lot of the time you don't know what you don't know, right? And so someone is giving you that syllabus and saying, here are the things that we think it's important for you to know. And again, that just felt like this huge indulgence to be able to do. And so yeah. I've been dreaming about going back to college for years and years and years. And so cybersecurity was something I was really interested in, but felt very intimidated by how broad and how huge and how deep it can go. So I wanted to have that sort of expertise to sort of lead me and, and give me a, the foundations, I guess. Yeah. What did you do? Like, like describe kind of your path into cybersecurity from a more, you know, Jack of all trades, software developer type mm -hmm. background. Yeah, I think cybersecurity just kept coming up again and again and again. Um, I think obviously it's become like a huge problem, right? Like we've actually seen sort of the um, the growth of things like ransomware and scammers. And, you know, we're seeing that even in the age of, of you know, generative AI now. That's another tool that scammers are using. It just kept popping up again and again and again. And every time it popped up for me, I just got like, really excited um because i just thought it was really really fascinating and so you know i did owasp training at uh zappos which i now know is a privilege that most workplaces don't give their software engineers they just expect you to know but when i started it was mandatory that i did an owasp training that was held on site at zappos and that was my first introduction actually to just hacking and threat actors and uh, how you can manipulate websites to, you know, to gain things. And that just blew the top off the, the lid off my brain, you know, and I was like, this is just ridiculously cool. I've never thought about software in this ad adversarial way. And I was just obsessed. Um, and so, you know, for years after that, I just kept sort of reading different books, you know, I'd read like, uh, books such as Cuckoo's Egg, which is an amazing sort of, you know, dramatized reenactment of, um, of you know, something that happened at the Berkeley, Berkeley yeah. um, in California. It was so cool. And then Stuxnet, I read about Stuxnet and I was like, oh my God, that's so cool. Um, and so I just, it just kept coming up as a reoccurring theme and same with embedded IoT stuff, you know, that IoT devices are riddled with software um, security issues. And so it just kept popping up again and again and again in my career. And, and I'm interested in it enough on a personal level that I decided to go to school, right, just to actually finally learn what I could about it. Yeah. And you also earned some certifications, which I think is worth noting, because a lot of people out there listening to this may be thinking about getting like some mm -hmm. like the Security Plus or Network Plus or so I think they're all CompTIA certifications. There may be some additional certifications from other vendors. Can you just like mm -hmm. quickly rattle off some of the certifications you've earned over the past few years and <laughs> what you learned from them, <laughs> what they involve for people that yeah, might be interested sure. in getting them? So just a disclaimer, um, all of those certifications were requirements for my bachelor degree in cybersecurity. So WGU like puts a big sort of heavy... Um, focus on getting industry certifications, um, which, you know, a lot of industry actually recommends that students get. That's what they desire in new grads, especially cybersecurity new grads. So I got um, A+. plus. I've always wanted to get my CompTIA A+, plus actually, and I, I was so emotional when I finally got it. Um, so A+, plus, Network+, plus, Security+, plus, um, Cyber Analyst+, plus, Pen Tester+. Plus. Um, I got the... Um, there were a bunch of other ones that I, ISC squared, um, I think like secure, it's basically the IS, ISC squared equivalent of security plus. I feel so bad because now I can't remember them off the top of my head. I also got project plus, which is a project management one, which was I actually found really interesting. Uh, a lot of people hated that one, but I thought it was useful. Because project management is useful in any kind of capacity, right? Whether you're planning to move cities, whether you're like, you know, writing software, right? So I found that really helpful. So yeah, just a whole bunch of them. There were yeah. more, I've just forgotten them. So yeah, and is yeah, it... the experience was really good. 
what, what was the experience like? Like you just studied, did you actually have to report to a physical testing center and like take a test with like some, somebody standing over you to make sure you didn't cheat? For one of them, I had to, um, and that was the ISC squared one because they do like a palm vein scan wow. to make sure that you are the identity you're saying you are. And I got sort of searched and I had to put my glasses on a tray and I had to spin the glasses around to make sure that they weren't augmented glasses. It was really intense. <laughs> <laughs> but the the rest of them I actually did via online proctoring and that's because I was doing that bachelor degree during the pandemic so CompTIA had actually pivoted to allowing people to test from home um, so I don't know if that's still an option but it definitely was during the pandemic where they would install basically spyware software on your computer which sucked um, and then you had to quit everything you had to show the proctor that you weren't running any like cheating software or anything and then you would do your exam on the computer at home. So I was lucky that I didn't have to find a testing center for most of them because I think that just adds extra stress. Yeah. And uh, so you finish the degree, you finish these certifications, you're going back into the job market, but this time not as a general software engineer or front end developer, like all the different things you were doing before, but as an actual security researcher. What was that process like? And, you know, what was it like kind of assuming that new role? And yeah, it was really cool. I, I think that um, what gave me a soft landing was that it was still a software role, but I was just moving over to work for a research team. Um, and so I'd be working with data scientists and um, actual researchers with PhDs, right, in cybersecurity and things like that. Um, and so it was more sort of a soft move over there. and. I got noticed because, you know, I was putting all these certifications on my LinkedIn and I was uh, I was doing a security lead position at Stripe at the time too. So I was sort of trying to cut my teeth on more security focused roles. So I sort of tried to just subtly transition and take on more and more in my current job. And that's sort of what got me noticed um, by my boss at CrowdStrike who actually cold reached out to me um, and said, would you be interested in, you know, applying for the specific job in research? And it was threat hunting research specifically. And so, but when I joined, um, so I ended up applying, getting the job and I joined CrowdStrike and I can tell you that the bachelor's degree made my job so much easier, even though I was still writing software, I understood why I was writing things. I knew how to use all the language and the words with the researchers and I could talk to the threat hunters and they'd mention like a hacking tool, you know, um, they'd mention something like bloodhound or they'd be talking about Mimi cats or something. And like, I knew exactly the, even just the context of what that, you know, particular intrusion was that we were looking at, um, and that my software was trying to surface. And so it was huge. Um, it made me feel like I didn't just do that degree for my own enjoyment. It ended up really just making my job much more fulfilling because I didn't feel intimidated and I, I understood everything that was going on. So that was a really, really lovely transition that I made in my career where everything just lined up really nicely. And, you know, the because I went so deep on all of the, you know, things in my bachelor degree, I didn't just do things to pass exams. I really engaged with things. I played with the tools. I really studied the certifications, not for the certification, but to actually learn something from the certification. It ended up just being such a huge reward when I actually moved into a position like that. Yeah. So you, it sounds like you're pretty happy with the transition. Like, well, was <laughs> it all sunshine and rainbows or like, well, is the grass always greener on the other side? Like, like, what was it like being an actual security researcher working? I mean, you were working, you say, oh, I took, I cut my teeth on a job at Stripe as a security lead or uh, what was it? <laughs> uh, I mean, that sounds like the type of, of job. Of my that team, yeah. I was the lead of my team, yeah. Yeah. But, but like. Yeah, it was, it, it was really more of a security champion. Like, you know, there are security champion programs in um, different software companies where, I was the tech lead of my actual team, um, of my software team, but then everyone, like the security team at Stripe, I did not work for the security team. They wanted every team to kind of have a security lead. So that were the representative for making sure that 
we were doing all the right things and that everyone was educated on the team when it comes to like good security practices and things like that, just because otherwise they're spread way too thin. So that was where I could say I was cutting my teeth on something that was not super high responsibility, but gave me an excuse to engage with the security team too. And just like use the actively use the knowledge that I was studying in the bachelor's. So that was it was actually one of the best transitions I've ever had in my career, honestly. I like it just everything was just so lucky. Like when I moved over to CrowdStrike, uh, they write a lot of their software in Go, in Golang, and I'd learned Golang at Stripe. And so the transition just could not have been nicer, um, especially given it was a remote job. I was the only one in Australia working for that team at CrowdStrike. So I really had to be quite self-sufficient even when I was ramping up because there wasn't always someone available to help me at the t- during the time zone, um, yeah. you know, non-overlaps, I guess. Yeah, is, is CrowdStrike an American company? Sorry, yes. I, I know this is like a super ignorant question I could have just Googled, but like, uh, no, no, like no, pretty no. much every big no. company you've worked at, it sounds like has been an American company. So you've always had to deal with the, like, I guess since you moved back to Australia, you've always had to deal with this like substantial time difference. I mean, it's incredible time difference. Like I'm getting ready to put my kids to bed and you're literally waking up and it's like 8 a.m. there and you're, you're kind of getting started with your day. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like, so you had to learn, a lo- did you do a lot of this asynchronously? Do you think that a lot of your experience doing open source and doing things, communicating through GitHub issues and pull requests and stuff, was that helpful? Just having that experience communicating through open source for working remotely at an American company from Australia? Yeah, hundred percent. Actually, I've never drawn that link before. That's very astute. Um, that definitely helped me just being comfortable with asynchronous stuff and going to bed, you know, having left a message for someone and knowing that when you wake up in the morning, they will have responded and just learning to be patient. Absolutely. That was very helpful. And um, yeah, I've, I guess I've never thought about it before, but that was very, um, very, very similar experience. Um, and you know, in, in open source, sometimes you're just like, well, I'd open an issue, but what if I just go splunking through the code base? Maybe I'll actually be able to find the issue and fix it myself and save everyone some time and then just open a pull request. It's that same kind of thing where sometimes I'd have questions and I'm like, screw it. You know, it's, it's, um, like I would work from 7am my time till 3pm, uh, my time just to get a bit more overlap with people in the States. Um, you know, I willingly did those hours, but w- once you got to like noon, my time, I was like, well, I'm just going to spunk through the source code because there's no documentation. Cause we're a research team. You know, we just have a lot of ephemeral stuff that we can't always be documenting. So I'll just jump into the code base. So yeah, I think it was a very similar approach to op- that, that it was to open source. Yeah. How do you feel about like, real-time communication tools like Slack and things like that versus, you know, asynchronous communication like email and I guess IRC. IRC is more like Slack, but like uh, systems where you communicate through the system, like you open a ticket as opposed to just, you know, jumping in and immediately talking to somebody in Slack or something like that. Like, do you do you think that, what are your thoughts on that? Synchronous versus asynchronous yeah, that's communication. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't like asynchronous at all. Um, Slack stresses me out, but I think that's the case for just about everybody. Um, I prefer real time at all times, honestly, um, unless, you know, unless you need time to think. So what was really nice was, you know, like obviously Slack and emails and everything and meetings would all fall off at a certain point of my day. So I would get a lot of focus time. So I think asynchronous communication is really great for that, where you don't always have to be in contact with people all the time. You can just leave a message, even if they're like, you know, not working and you just hope they've got do not disturb on, you know, you can leave them a message and they'll just get back whenever. I think that's really nice and convenient. Um, And again, you get a lot of space to just focus and not be interrupted, which I've never had before in a job for a long time. So I did use that time zone to my advantage. But at the end of the day, something that I learned at Stripe especially was if you're having issues with something, just hit someone up and say, can we just jump into a a video meeting or a a voice meeting really quickly? And it was just so much better. Um, Our team at Stripe really um, valued and, and put a strong motivation on saying, just jump into a room with each other and just talk it out. And it was so much better. You know, as long as you've got a supportive team 
that you know is not intimidating to work with and nobody cares about pairing you can just share your screen really quick uh, we just got so much more done doing it that way than like back and forth on on slack and trying to yeah. word it in a proper way and things like that so yeah i much prefer to just do it face to face these days yeah awesome uh i want to talk a little bit about like infosec as a field uh i know you, you participate mm -hmm. did you participate in some capture the flag events early on yeah uh a lot of those were sort of brought to us from you know my peers when i was studying cybersecurity. um and so i took part in a lot of collegiate ones actually so ones for students so it's not as difficult um but also you can kind of benchmark yourself against your your peers so i did a number of ctfs um which i really enjoyed uh it just gives you a chance to apply your skills and to see kind of where you're at and what you need to improve at and so yeah ctf stands for capture the flag and it's really just they're sort of just hacking challenges um sometimes your job is to defend something or to be um someone who reverse engineers something so you're sort of on the the good guys side and then sometimes the um ctf events are about actually being the bad person um, and, you know, being the threat actor and you have to try and hack into something. And some are like both, they're a mix, you know. And so I guess it's kind of similar to a software hackathon, you know, where there's a competition and you have to make an app. This is sort of the infosec version of it where you have to apply your skills to either defend or attack something, which is just really cool. Um, and so I did Codebreaker, which is put on by the National Security Agency, the NSA. Oh, wow, which is really the NSA, like the um, big bad NSA that everybody's terrified of. <laughs> yeah, the NSA. I'm going to get something really funny for you. Yeah. Okay, so Suze has gotten up from her chair. She's running back to her yeah, workbench to pull again. something off the pegboard. So okay. this is a fidget spinner from the NSA. And this was what I got from them because I finished in like, I was in the top, 100 or whatever of their reverse engineering competition so that's my little um weird souvenir a lime green nsa fidget spinner have you taken it <laughs> so apart to make sure there's not like a microphone stuff. in there <laughs> no but a lot of people have said that and i think it's really interesting i remember getting the um envelope in the mail the package in the mail and it just says like from national security agency and i think i put it on social media and i said oh well they found me it was nice knowing you all or something like that <laughs> it's like every time you get a message from the irs it's just like you see, you see that irs that iconic you know typeface mm -hmm. they use and you're just like your yeah. stomach just goes oh, oh no <laughs> you know yeah then you open feeling. it and it's just like it hey, was we're really processing weird because i forgot solution. Exactly, exactly. So when it came, I had a similar thought. I forgot all about that I'd filled out my shipping address and everything. And I was like, what is, oh, and then I realized a second later. So I definitely had that IRS moment where I was just like, I hope this is what I think it is because I have gotten letters like that from the IRS and it's absolutely terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, I want, I want to be respectful of your time. I've got a lot of rapid fire questions I'm going to start asking. If that's cool with you, Suze. Yes, do it. So just just mm -hmm. to like kind of like uh, recap your journey so far. So you you uh, you started off with a computer in your house, uh, Commodore sixty four. The thankfully it was an older model, and that was a that way you got to spend a lot more time in the command line and stuff like that. That spurred your creativity. You went on to study a great deal of different technologies in, as a, at, at a uh, gosh, what is the acronym? TEF? TEF? The, uh, the community T T A F E TAFE yeah T A F E yeah. and I, I've written down what that acronym stands for in here. Uh, it stands for oh, it's somewhere in my notes. <laughs> sorry, I'm learning all about Australia. Um, okay, so I'm not going to define that acronym. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll put it in the show notes. Uh, but uh, basically, like community colleges. So you went there, and from there, um, you ultimately were able to work at advertising agencies. You applied for a job in Las Vegas, you had to move and to the iconic campus of uh, Zappos, which uh, the in, in, innovation, have you ever been to that? It's like Nevada, like innovation. And it's like the, the shape of Nevada. I went to a hackathon there mm -hmm. and, and that like entire kind of like startup ecosystem was built out by Tony Shea and the Zappos crew to try to mm -hmm. build like an entrepreneurial 
I guess, satellite to mm -hmm. Silicon Valley that was, you know, five or six hour drive away. Yeah, um, totes. So you did that, totes. That's something only Australians say, like, totes cool. <laughs> <laughs> am, I, am I correct? Or, like, have you ever, okay. So if you ever hear an Australian say totes thing. cool. Oh, okay. is it British? Okay. Well, um, I've only I heard think Australian so. I didn't think it. we made it up. Okay. Okay. Well, um, sorry if I'm uh, attributing something to the Australian people that should be attributed to the Brits. Um, okay, so what I want to know is uh, during your streaming, back when you were live coding a lot, you had this like very cool, like, first of all, you got like beautiful taste in like mechanical keyboards and everything's like very elegant and uh, like thoughtfully put together. And, and you know, just like your, your, uh, your background there uh, with like, Everything is very deliberately thought out in terms of your physical space. But in terms of the software you use, do you put a lot of time into customizing your tooling for when you're sitting down to write some code? I do, but then I just leave it. Like I'm not constantly tweaking it. Um, yeah. Yeah, M MP MPJ from Fun Fun Function back in the day, I think he put it best. Like he stops himself doing it because he knows that he'll just do it forever and it's just a distraction. So... Um, I've had this exact same Vim config file for years now, years and years and years and years. This probably hasn't changed in five years. Just set something up, make it so that it's tolerable to you and then just let it go. Like, you know, that's sort of been my attitude. It's not for everyone, but that's worked really, really well for me. So yeah, it's just nice color scheme, all of that. It's got some of the basic tools that I need. Um, and I don't try to customize anything to death anymore. It's just frustrating to have to set up automated scripts to get it all back the way you want it when you have a new computer or, if, yeah. you know, something happens and it's just a waste of time. Yeah. So just good enough and then don't micromanage it anymore. Yep. Sounds like, yeah. And so you're, you're yeah, just leave it alone. Yeah. <laughs> if somebody wanted to learn them, which is kind of like a, a code editor that has a little bit steeper of a learning curve because you have to learn like all the keyboard uh shortcuts you got to learn like the different the three i think it's three different modes like insertion mode and mm. you know like how Visual uh, mode, yeah. would you recommend it like do you think it was worth learning it mm, yes and no honestly i think it's like one of those huge it depends kind of things um if you do want to learn it you want to go cold turkey um I found it was very frustrating for two weeks, but I wouldn't let myself go back to sublime text, which is what I used to use. Just get through it. Um, and I would say it's been really good because I do spend much more time on servers these days, just like, you know, like into shell sessions and stuff like that. It is so useful to just pop open Vim and start typing. But at the same time, like Nano is there for people to use too, and it's much easier to use. So to be honest, I wouldn't recommend it because it just depends on what you want to actually get out of something, you know. Um, I really enjoy it just because it feels minimal. It uses not as not as much processes on my computer. Sorry, not, not as much, you know, resources on my computer. But, you know, at the same time, it's been a net positive for me, but I wouldn't say, you know, it's been life changing. I think I'm just such a casual Vim user. It's not like the Primogen or um, Gary Bernhardt or other people who you, you see they're just like total wizards in it. I don't know. I just I'm not someone who's really obsessed about my editor. It's just if it's good enough, it's good enough. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a bit of a nothing burger answer, but I just don't think it's worth it if you're already happy with your tool, whatever, you know. Well, to quote something that you said that I thought was was kind of interesting, that, uh, that uh, interesting enough to be written down and quoted on the Free Code Camp podcast, you said, don't put your identity, don't put your identity into a single tool. And it sounds like, mm -hmm. yeah, it sounds like that's the, the vibe you get. Like, if the tool works well enough, you know, Nano. I use Nano all the time when I go on servers. Uh, you can just type Nano, and mm -hmm. it's built into like I think every Linux distribution, uh, and it's just like a mm -hmm. Emacs-like environment. Emacs curiously isn't default in a lot of like different server versions of Ubuntu and stuff. So I can't use Emacs when I go in there. So I just use Nano, which is very similar uh, shortcuts and stuff. But you know, whatever gets the job done, really, at the end of the day, right? Um, yeah. And I want to like reconcile the so you have spent a lot of time shoring up the foundational knowledge of computer science of how networks work uh you know security concepts uh, how computers actually work 
and it sounds like early on in your career you were working with like really powerful tools that were like highly abstracted away and now as you've advanced your skills you've gone like kind of further down the the you know veritable stack of mattresses that the princess is lying on top of to see where the peas are you know <laughs> um how do you reconcile the tension between wanting to get things done and also wanting to like further cement your understanding of fundamentals so you can get things done faster in the future? Yeah, I think that's actually a really tough thing for anybody to manage, including myself. Uh, I don't have a great answer for it. Um, I think for me, what I find really enjoyable when you go deep on something is when you're not having to be constantly distracted by having to look things up or feeling like you're hitting a brick wall because you're just missing some foundations on something. It's not enjoyable to go deep if you know that you're missing certain foundations, especially like right around that particular topic area. So I think the motivation for me a lot of the time now is to zoom back, even though it feels awful to rip yourself out of that, you know, rabbit hole you're in. It's, it's the excitement of knowing that, okay, I'm going to fill in these foundations. I'm going to find something super interesting while filling that in anyway. So it's still going to be an enjoyable process. And then when I actually go deep, it's going to be so much more productive. You're going to have this lovely intuition. You're going to have those deep flow moments. You know, you're going to be playing the synth music and just like churning something out. I think it's just, you've got to find a motivation to enjoy those deep dives way more because you're not feeling imposter syndrome and you're not just feeling like I'm never going to get this. You know, the foundations have just opened up so much in my programming world where I can, I can just like flip flop around and, and just kind of dive in and out of different things now. And I'm just not feeling like it's this awful kind of stumble in the dark. Um, and so there are times when I still find it hard not to just go deep on something. Um, but I think it's worth putting in the effort because things just feel way more effortless later on. And it's really hard to give people this advice because it's one of those things where you don't get it until you actually do it. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, it's, it's really difficult for me to really give that advice just because you, you don't know until you actually feel that. Uh, and feel that reward of it. So, yeah. When you were streaming for several years, basically articulating your thoughts and like making them palatable, you know, as a teacher, kind of like taking your thought process and orating it, uh, uh, verbalizing it. Do you think that that helped you um, code better? Do you think, or do you think, like, would you encourage people to like kind of think out loud while they're coding? Do you, do you ever do that anymore? Is that like a habit of like, do you talk to yourself while you're coding? Or do you think that that slows, thing, slows things down a lot? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna go out there and just say, I think in general, whenever I streamed on a Sunday, as far as productivity, problem solving, challenge factor, it was net negative, honestly. <laughs> you know, I just, sometimes it was nice to explain to other people and they'd, they'd sort of give another perspective but a lot of the time, because I had a lot of the domain knowledge of the embedded stuff, like some people could jump in with like, oh, well, what if you just like did a promise here instead or something like some of the JavaScript kind of side of things, I would get some cool ideas from people. But overall, it was a net negative because I find it so hard to focus while I'm also talking. I find it so hard to be kind of on the spot and have people watching me. And so it's not helpful. But the, the thing that it did help me with was pair programming at work became like just not intimidating at all I'm like let's just jump into it and I was okay with saying I didn't know something and it gave me a lot more confidence with like working with other people because if you can live stream in front of a couple hundred people on a Sunday and make mistakes in front of them then you can pretty much just not feel afraid of of, of working with any colleague after that in my opinion so it definitely helped with that I would say that that was actually kind of life-changing to be honest um, it made my day-to-day -day work with other people much better because I used to feel very intimidated about coding in front of others. Um, but the rest of it was honestly just a net negative. <laughs> yeah. Well, it sounds like uh, you did get something out of the process, <laughs> even if like those yeah, particular days you sat down the to streaming. code. Like it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. 
It was yeah. a lot of actual fun. Like we had heaps of fun. I just meant programming wise and actually getting stuff done and things like that. It was a bit of a, a drag on that. So there's the saying that like, if you want to go far, go together. If you want to go fast, go alone or something like that. Uh, yes. Yeah. I, it's, it's more interesting if you reverse it. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Right. And so it's kind of like you had the entire, you know, hundreds of people like cheering you on. Yeah. Sus, sus, sus. And like, you're mm -hmm. trying to, you know, close the PR or whatever. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it yeah. sounds like the fact that you stuck with it for so long. I mean, you even, I think I heard you built your own streaming platform or you started to build a streaming platform just because you were unsatisfied. What was, what's the story behind the Suze Hinton streaming platform? Yeah. I just thought that Twitch was crap for software programming streams. I'll just come out and say it. it's crap. It's not good for that. And also Twitch incentivizes, you know, it's a, it's a company that wants to profit. So, you know, the profit incentives just created bad experiences, especially for like programming streamers. Like I could talk to you about this for an hour, so I won't. Um, and so I just went out and wanted to create my own platform that respected the privacy of my users that didn't, that allowed them to use emotes without having to sign up for a paid subscription, you know, so we could have our own inside jokes and things um, that allowed me to just have all these different features that were useful for programming streams that Twitch would never do. Right. Um, and so there were just a lot of misaligned incentives I felt using Twitch as a platform. Uh, and I, I had enough of a community that I felt that they would be willing to make an account on my website and then actually watch me and, and interact with me there and that they'd remember I was streaming there and things like that. So I went out and started making that. And then the pandemic hit right when I was getting close to releasing it. And, you know, just obviously that just put, you know, a lot of different things in perspective. And I put it down for a bit just because, you know, the pandemic was a tough thing to get through. And by the time I was sort of coming out of that, I wanted to stop streaming. So it just never got released, unfortunately. But it was a really cool experience actually yeah. programming it. Yeah, maybe yeah. it'll come back one day. <laughs> Definitely. And if, if there's like an open source alternative that people can just self-host a website and stream themselves on it. I mean, streaming has got to be expensive though in terms of like all the data that is involved. And like, like only a company like Amazon would have the coffers to be able to do that like economically like I, I don't know how expensive it is to pipe HD video to like 200 people concurrently <laughs> uh, is that something where you think an individual creator could actually run like a streaming platform like let's say it was like you know a self-hosted tool and you just threw up your server would would the bandwidth on that be like crazy or how would it, how would it work yeah, that's a good question. I ended up creating like a matrix in Microsoft Excel and I looked at every single streaming option, everything from Amazon's own streaming technology uh, to, you know, uh, just like smaller companies that were offering it at the time and all of the different features and whether or not they had closed captioning for the live streams, whether you had video on demand, all that kind of thing. So I did actually do all the research and it is possible. So I ended up standing up a very beefy machine I got a dedicated server in a data center, um, wasn't actually that expensive. And then, um, I ended up ha having like several hundred gigs of like bandwidth. I think it was up to a terabyte of bandwidth or something like that, um, per month. Um, and so, and then I did a whole bunch of tests. Like I spun up Kubernetes to create all of these like spontaneous, you know, up to 500 connections to see if the box would stand up and if the traffic you know, how much traffic that was generating and how much bandwidth and things like that. So it's definitely possible because years ago I was able to prove that as a proof of concept in 2019. And I think that tools have gotten a lot better since then anyway. So yeah, the answer is yes, it's possible. You just have to do the research and be willing to have your own dedicated piece of metal. So. Yeah. Uh, have you ever heard of Cloudflare TV? It's like a 24 seven at the time, but yeah. Yeah, a 24-7 stream focused on technical topics. And uh, it's it's kind of like what you're talking about. It's like a platform, but it's really just Cloudflare. Like, I'm, I'm, you can just press play, and you can mm -hmm. watch people, like, live streaming there 24-7. And I think some of it's probably pre-recorded. It doesn't have chat. Uh, but it is cool, like, the notion that, like, like I always fancied, like, Free Code Camp could have Free Code Camp TV. And it would just be, like, an old-school broadcast channel from, you know, the terrestrial, you know, 
uh, satellite, uh, like airwave, you know, like UHF. If you ever saw the 1980s movie UHF where, with Weird Al Yankovic, like we could theoretically do that using tools that Cloudflare has published. But I still think that like what you're talking about is, is a little bit different because it's like Twitch in a box, basically, it sounds like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would be very interested if you do pursue that uh, at some point or if you decide to get back into that project, let me know. I would be very interested in following that and uh, I'll certainly try to help encourage people to uh, contribute to it. So what is on the horizon for Suze Hinton? What, what are the big goals? Like we're basically out of the pandemic. Um, you have an entire new skill set that you gained. It sounds like you made incredible use of that time. Uh, what are your plans for the next few years? Yeah, you kind of caught me at a crossroads. So I, I, I quit that job, the research job, a um, couple of months ago. It was an amazing job. Um, I just want to take a little bit of time off for myself. That's all. That was a very hard decision, actually, because I loved my team. Um, I just need some time off. I, I am carrying a little bit of burnout and I'm just finishing up my master's degree as well. I'm working on my thesis at the moment. So it seems like good timing for me to just focus just on the thesis, just spend a little bit of time like recouping, um, you know, just being well enough again and things like that. Um, so yeah, like I'm keeping things open ended this year. Um, I will be finished and hopefully graduating by July. So that's actually not that far away. It's May right now. So I think six to eight weeks I'll be finished with the master's uh, thesis. And to be honest, I'm trying to keep things open. Um, and so I'll be doing a little bit of contract work for the rest of the year in software. Um, and I'm looking to maybe start working on some online education courses because I'd love to get back into teaching. So yeah, just not putting a lot of pressure on myself, but just getting around to personal software projects I've been putting off for years because I've been in school, you know, since the pandemic started and, and things like that. So just, you know, sort of being able to slow down a bit and just come back to some of the things that are just really important to me um, so that I can also just help shed a lot of the burnout of just working in the industry as well. Cause this is my 20th year in the industry. Um, You know, it would be, sadly it would be a bit strange if I didn't have a a little bit of burnout at this point. Right. Yeah. Can you talk about like, and I don't want to put you on the spot, uh, but can you talk about like how you sensed, burnout was setting in like what was there some like moment that you were just like damn i think i'm burning out or was it just like a gradual creeping process like be, because i mean it, it seems like you have arrived at that conclusion i'm burning out i need to change i need to take some time off i'm curious for people that are listening to this who may also be closing in on a decade or two decades doing software development like how they can recognize this and know that they need to take time off before things get even worse yeah for sure it's a it's a really important question a lot of it is creeping up um but for me it was like a spike in anxiety every day when you just have to do normal things so if someone hits you up on slack and it's just totally normal it's they're not asking you for anything urgent they just want to talk to you and you just start feeling overwhelmed every time Um, or just it spikes your anxiety and you just you start withdrawing from people you don't want to talk to them at work even though they're they're your teammates you just yeah you find yourself isolating yourself and then on top of that your productivity just takes a huge dive so you know that there'll be days where there'll be nothing wrong going in your life but getting out of bed is really hard and then you sit at the computer and you just don't do any work and you're just sort of your brain is screaming at you so you're like we have to do something today and it just doesn't happen you know and then the next day there's a lot of pressure you feel guilty so you're able to kind of push through and and do it but it just feels everything just feels like you're walking through you know trying to get out of quicksand even though you're getting your job done it just feels so wrong and you're having to just absolutely force yourself and you're avoiding talking to anybody and everything just feels like a huge overload on you when it's just normal day-to-day duties. I think that was the first signs for me, just total disengagement, but, you know, obviously still trying your best to do your job because you need to make money to survive. Right. Um, and it just feeling wrong, even though you couldn't find any other reason in your life why you're struggling to show up every day, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And 
Uh, what are some things that you're doing now that you have some time to yourself? Like, how are you kind of decompressing and like rejuvenating yourself? Uh, and uh, like, I guess, tending to that, that wound of just burned out, I guess, that, that psychic wound. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think I've just been able to trying to find joy um, so that when I start feeling better, like I'm still engaged with the things I enjoy. I haven't taken a total break from everything, if that makes sense. So I'm reading a lot, reading way more. Um, and I'm reading about things like computer history um, and just other things, you know, like I'm um, watching a lot of video game documentaries on how video games are put together, like just and and watching a lot of creators on YouTube do what they love. So just watching other people who aren't burnt out or who I don't think are burnt out, really engaging with the things they enjoy so that I can get that reminder of why I, you know, why I love being a software engineer or why I love doing embedded stuff or, or why, you know, I have these hobbies that I have that I just don't feel like I can engage with at the moment. So just trying to stay connected, um, but also trying to do low energy things like that, right? Like reading a book or watching a documentary is, is quite low energy. It's forgiving yourself for not being productive, but it's just keeping you connected all the same to the communities that you feel inspired by. I think that's been the biggest thing I've been able to do so that I'm not just sitting around feeling sorry for myself, if that makes sense, or feeling guilty for it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that sounds great. Like, I'll you know, share that, like, I watch lots of documentaries on YouTube. Uh, I, I read a lot. Uh, I go mm -hmm. for long walks with podcasts and I attribute, I guess my longevity, which isn't as long as yours, 20, like I, I've been doing free cooking for like 10 years almost. Uh, so <laughs> I'm very much trying to pace myself cause I've had so many friends who've just hit a brick wall with burnout. And, uh, but I'm, it sounds like you're doing everything you need to do to recover. So, we're pulling for you to be like back to full power eventually, whenever that is. Uh, but um, yeah, thank, I really appreciate you sharing that because in tech we have this like kind of mythos around like productivity I and mean, it's, it's an American thing, right? America's obsessed with productivity. Uh, and it, you know, uh, I don't know if that was like a cultural shock when you went to the U S where everybody's like so focused on work and career defines who they are. So it was. Much. Yeah. I mean, was there yeah, a moment? It was huge. Uh, it was really hard, actually. Was there a moment where you were at, like a dinner party and like people asked you what you did and like like where you realized, wow, this is different from like where I'm from. Like people don't, you know. Uh, immediately, the difference was was immediate. Um, and just yeah, just seeing seeing people really struggle to even like leave a job because they felt like their identity was in it or like people who try to build empires in jobs because that's like their identity. It's just people's identity being so deeply embedded in not just like what they do for a living, but also that specific company and the team or like the, the project that they're on, like people putting their identity into the specific project and them feeling bad if they're working on something that's not as exciting as their, their, as their other colleague is, is, you know, working on something way cooler. That really, really shocked me. I feel very, very um, grateful that that's not something that I've ever really had a problem with. Like I can see that and see it's unhealthy and I'm not interested. And um, it's just been, it's just been a, a huge contrast. And, and I don't think that, I just don't think that I could ever really do that. And again, that's probably privileged to a degree, but I just, I turn off, I want to do the best job I can within reason. And then I want to be a really great teammate to work with, but I just don't want to put any identity in it beyond that, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. But it, it really threw me when I first moved there. And some people did actually judge me for that. They thought that I wasn't being a team player and things like that. And, but I would say that what I was doing was completely reasonable. I wasn't, slacking off or anything like that uh i was just being realistic yeah, you weren't letting, <laughs> in my opinion so you weren't letting work completely take over your life like a lot of people allow that to exactly happen. like the, like your employer will let will take as much of your time and energy as they can they'll put you on that fancy you mm -hmm. know google bus and and have you writing code while you commute instead of you know uh like like as much of your time and energy and they'll, they'll serve dinner really late at night so you'll stay for the free meal so you'll work a little later mm -hmm. right 
like all those little tricks that they do to get you uh or or they call the company a family instead of just being you know a team right Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. a lot of those things that are like i I don't know if they do it i mean i think they do that in places like china and japan and stuff like other countries that have unhealthy work cultures (laughs) but uh but i'm heartened to hear that it it isn't like that in australia right like it, not not to the extent it is in the U.S. Not to the extent it can be. I think that I think that we all fall into the trap. I think that no country is really like completely immune. It's just not to the same degree for sure. So I definitely feel that I fit more into the cult, the working culture here. Um, people are working a lot right now just because cost of living and and working is very stressful. But it's just not the same identity entrenchment here. Um, yeah. and yeah, people do want to go home to their families and stuff like that. So, yeah, well, I don't usually, I, like I want to end on a positive note and not just on, on like, uh, you know, American work culture and my beef with it and, and, you know, burnout and things like that. <laughs> since you've been reading a lot yeah, of books, of we don't usually do recommendations since you've been reading a lot of books and you watch a lot of video game documentaries, what are some recommends that you have for people who've listened this far into the podcast? Are there any channels that you just like love watching yeah. the fire you up? Yeah, so um, one of the main channels that I love so much is Nerdforge. Nerdforge. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll list all of these. They just do really creative stuff. I'm so into them. I'm trying to figure out what the documentary one I watch. I think it's called Cut Clip. Cut Clip. But I'm trying to remember the name of the channel. I'm just scrolling through YouTube right now trying to find it for you. While you're, while you're scrolling for it, I'm going to throw in one of my recommendations. This channel is so great they do like retro gaming documentaries and they do like the best kind of like nostalgic 3d graphics and stuff it's called uh it's called splash wave and th- so they'll cover like how sonic oh. sonic the hedgehog was made and you know talk about michael jackson's involvement in the development of the music and that he was like a huge fan of sonic the hedgehog and he actually approached them because he wanted to make music that's with. cool uh or um they'll talk about uh you know the history of like different like sega games different arcade games they'll talk about like the architecture that made certain arcade games possible that's and they, cool. they model all this stuff so a lot of the shots are like effect shots and stuff it's so cool and it's got like that that kind of like you know synth retro wave type uh sound going on so um yeah what are some other channels you recommend yeah so the the channel is no clip no clip um yes. that's the video game documentary channel yeah they are fantastic um and as far as books go, right now I am absolutely loving The Dream Machine. It's just, it's such a good book. Um, it's very dense and very long, but I just, it is, it is the best narrative about just how computing came to be. Um, it's just an absolutely delightful read. I've been really inspired by that. So that's the main one that I'm reading at the moment. But before that, I read um, Space Rogue, I think, Space Rogue. That one is about, you know, the um, original cult of the dead cow um, hacking group. They're really, really cool. And so Space Rogue was one of the um, pseudonyms of the one of the members of the group, I believe. Very cool. Yeah, I can't I remember. believe I'm blanking on all of this stuff. I remember the yeah. cults of the dead cow <laughs> back in like the, the BBS days and stuff. We would, uh... They are so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Dream Machine, Space Rogue, Nerdforge, Noclip. I will second that. I love the Noclip hades development uh series it's like four hours worth of like how they yeah. made the game hades i think it is called hades right like it's, it's like a kind of isometric is, yeah. perspective where you're like zipping around and fighting like mm-hmm. all these greek gods and stuff it's cool um so Suze, i just want to thank you again for like 20 years in the field and you're still sharing your wisdom and uh i'm very excited to talk with you offline about like you know software development education that's something very passionate about and uh we will take as much Sue's hinton as we can on the free code camp youtube channel like publishing your tutorials anything we can do to help get that wisdom out there uh to as many people as we can freely uh, so i want to thank you again for making time to come on the free code camp podcast yeah thanks for having me this has been a really fun conversation yeah and everybody listening until next week happy coding <laughs>